click on this. All right. Well, I will go ahead and kick it off, assuming that recording's going okay. And um, I, I just thought it would be nice to kick this off with a quote from the famous June Jordan, who was, of course, a famous poet and essayist and activist. Um, and it really, her quote is about, her statement is about poetry, but I really think a lot of it applies to all forms of creative resistance, the expression of resistance, including prose, because so much of the prose that you all write and that we publish, I think, has poetry embedded within it. So June Jordan. And so poetry is not a shopping list, a casual disquisition on the colors of the sky, a soporific daydream or bumper sticker sloganeering. Poetry is a political action undertaken for the sake of information, the faith, the exorcism, and the lyrical invention that telling the truth makes possible. Poetry means taking control of the language of your life. Good poems can interdict a suicide, rescue a love affair, and build a revolution in which speaking and listening to somebody becomes the first and last purpose to every social encounter. Thanks guys for listening to that. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful, right? All right, so I'm gonna um, turn over the first introduction to Renee. Uh, we, we're, we're going to start with, uh, not with a poem, but with a fiction piece, uh, Nikki Blakely's A Woman of Good Manners. Oh, and before, okay. <laughs> but you have some time before I uh, be before I pass the microphone to you. I'm going to read your bio. Okay. Uh, as a way to introduce you to everybody else, uh, Nikki uh, Blake li lives in San Francisco in the Bay Area with her partner and a precocious gray tabby named Ted. She enjoys writing fiction of all shapes, sizes, and genres, crafting stories that evoke smiles, tears, laughter, the occasional eye roll and sometimes even a scream. Her work has been published in Sundial Magazine, Bright Flash Fiction, Luna Station Quarterly, and others. You can find her on Twitter at, at Blakely99. And uh, Nikki, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so um, I just wanna let you guys know I've never read before. So I've only practiced this about a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guaranteed to stumble over words anyway, so just letting you know. <laughs> All right, here we go. A woman of good manners. It is a universal truth that a man of good fortune must be in want of a wife, and Jane set her sights on Edward, despite his reputation for being of a most disagreeable character. On their first date, they went to Possum Pond. Jane had always been told the way to a man's heart was through his stomach. She smiled coyly at Edward as she opened the picnic basket and placed the food onto a red checkered tablecloth laid out under the shade of a large elm tree. Ham and Swiss sandwiches with the crust cut off, red potato salad with tiny cornichons and tart sweet lemonade, freshly squeezed. Edward ate heartily while Jane merely picked at her food as was befitting a woman of good manners. Afterward, she slipped off her stockings pulled her dress to her thighs and waded into the pond, beckoning Edward with the crook of her finger to follow, and follow he did. He came up behind her, grabbed her tightly by the neck, then pushed her face into the muddy murk of the shallow water and held it there until her body stopped thrashing. The next afternoon, it surprised Edward to see Jane strolling up the cobblestone pathway to his house, looking no worse for wear though he thought he noticed a slight smudge of dirt around the cuff of her sleeve. Darling, it's a beautiful day for a picnic, she said, exactly as she had the day before. And indeed it was. True, Jane was not an overtly handsome woman. Her countenance left Edward wanting, but her cooking skills were a credit to her housekeeping. And well, it was lunchtime and he was hungry. Edward pulled his hat and coat from the rack and once more they set off to Possum Pond. Today she brought crispy fried chicken, golden buttermilk biscuits and ice cold beer, and for dessert, cinnamon and apple hand pies. Jane only nibbled, she was a lady after all, while Edward ate his fill. 
Afterward, Edward picked up one of Jane's stockings that she had taken off, twisted it tightly around her neck and pulled sharply. Her hands clawed at her throat, her eyes bulged and her body thrashed until finally falling limp. The next day, Jane was on Edward's doorstep with only a slight reddening around her neck. Darling, it's a beautiful day for a picnic, she said, and off they went. She'd made a salad with fresh greens, crisp bacon, and soft boiled eggs. Edward washed it all down with sweet Southern tea, then finished the meal with vanilla macaroons. Afterward, he pulled out a knife he'd hidden in a sock and stabbed Jane in the neck. Watching the blood first spurt, then trickle, the red stain spreading like spilled wine across the checkered tablecloth. When Jane once again appeared on his doorstep the following day, Edward noticed a crimson spot on her collar and thought her smile waned slightly, but other than that, she remained nonplussed. They locked arms and set off for Possum Pond. As usual, they sat down under the cool shade of the elm and Jane removed the picnic basket. Beef tongue pie, pickled beets, butterscotch pudding, and sarsaparilla soda. After they had eaten, they lay down and spent the afternoon picking animal shapes from the clouds until Edward at last leaned over and kissed Jane on the lips. Then he placed his coat over her face and pressed down firmly until her arms stopped flailing about and she was completely still. Darling, it's a... Edward was already waiting at the door, coat and hat in hand. From the picnic basket, Jane pulled cold roast muffin, mutton. I did that every time. Cold roast mutton, deviled eggs, sweet mold cider and a raspberry tart. When Edward finished eating, she when Edward finished eating, he picked up a thick heavy log, smashed it over her head, once, twice, three times for good measure, until her body collapsed and crumpled to the ground in a heap. When Jane again showed up the next day, picnic basket in hand, it had been 5 days since their first date. She looked a little bedraggled with a smudge of dirt on her cuff, a reddening around her neck and a drop of blood on her collar. Her bun hung askew to the left and she walked with a slight limp. Edward considered Jane. She was not a great beauty nor an accomplished woman. By her own confession, she did not possess any knowledge of the pianoforte, was not skilled in the art of conversation and almost always lost at whist. Her prospects were most certainly limited. But her figure was slight and pleasing. She ate like a bird. And try as he might, she would not die. What she lacked in physical attributes, she made up for in tenacity. If he couldn't kill her, he'd marry her instead. He decided to propose that day directly after lunch. That day, as Jane had done every day before, she shook out the checkered tablecloth and spread it out under the shade of the elm. She slipped off her stockings and Edward, impatient to see what new delights the picnic basket held, took haste to open it before Jane had the opportunity. His countenance revealed his surprise at finding it empty and he looked to Jane for explanation. It is a universal truth that a woman of bad fortune might be in want of a good meal rather than a good husband, and there is a much faster way to a man's heart. With one hand, Jane grabbed Edward by the throat and plunged the other deep into his chest. She pulled out his heart, still beating, and bit into it like an apple, the blood dribbling down her chin. Then she picked up a napkin and dabbed daintily at the corners of her mouth. She was a woman of good manners, after all. Thank you very much, Nikki, and that was a great reading. Thank you. <laughs> it was it was a really fun fun story, gothic and romantic at the same time. And obviously, you were pulling from uh, uh, from Jane Austen. Even the name of the main character uh, <laughs> tells us that this is what you're uh, what you're doing. And um, I was intrigued by which was funny in the end by the specificity of the meal of the menus each time. <laughs> and I'm wondering what were your thoughts on that? With regard to the menu? Yeah, it gives, it uh, makes it very real. Yeah, I was just kind of going toward an old time, 
an old time vibe. Like I pictured myself going on the picnic, you know, and opening a basket and going uh, an old fashioned type of what kind of food they might have during that time. So I had fun with it. It it was fun. I um, obviously kind of a groundhog stay <laughs> type of thing, but um, you know, she gets her satisfaction in the end, which I found very satisfying myself. <laughs> Catherine Mansfield kind of rank, you know, ramped up. <laughs> so, I mean, who am I saying? What am I thinking, Catherine? Yes, Catherine Mansfield. And as Irene put in the chat, it's it's very right. Yeah, it's, it's very dry humor. And yes, as you say, it's satisfying also for the reader because after all those five dates. We are pulling for James. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, I enjoyed it. It's one of the one of my favorites that I've written, and I, I enjoyed reading it too. I'm really, really, I'm thankful for this opportunity. Even though, like I said, I practiced a hundred times, and I kept, I kept saying muffin for mutton every time I read it. So maybe I need to change it to muffin. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So our next reader is Wells Burgess and his poem is What is Truth? And I'm gonna read his brief bio. Uh, Wells Burgess began writing poetry late in life. His work has appeared in the Lyric, Measure, The Beltway Quarterly, Light, Think, Passenger, The Federal Poet, and Better Than Starbucks. In retirement, he teaches poetry at Encore Learning in Arlington, Virginia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, editors, and thank you, hosts, for bringing us all together. I think this is just great. Uh, I'm so pleased that you accepted this poem. I, I brought this up along with another bunch of poems to the Glenn Workshop. I don't know whether you're familiar with that. And uh, I started apologizing for this poem because, well, it, was it really a poem or a play or what? And he said, it's your best poem. So <laughs> anyway, so this poem is based on a real incident in the life of Huey Long, former governor of Louisiana, also known as the Kingfish. Um, but it, the rest of it is, is my fiction. And I hope that fiction portrays a, a larger truth. I, you know, at my, I don't know why I have never said <laughs> been able to do screen sharing. So I'm going to be looking down reading this, but, but uh, that's just the way things are. What is truth? Deep in the South, men gather. First among equals, the kingfish, upstage. And it is only he whose face you see. His minions, that includes me, Marky, have our backs to you. The boss plays solitaire. The cards slap the table. Marky, he says, where are we going to put that road? DeVroe and the boys got them all whopped up in Jasmine, I say. Chairman talking like it's yesterday. Folks so starved for traffic, they'll walk 10 miles on crutches to vote for you. Kingfish looks me in the eye. Marky, he says, I got a debt to pay. Judging by you going on and on about how we are destroying rural culture with the highway projects. Owns a big tract. We go and run that road right through it so he hears them big eight wheelers when he lays him down to rest. Boss, I says, we got a rally in Jasmine, big parade, big parade and all. Tenth grader singing a song he made up of the highway they're getting. Shall I call it off? Hell no, says the boss. He looks me right in the eye. Marky, he says, do you trust me? And I say back, I do. The scene goes dark and other lights. Jasmine Parish, scrub country, hard bitten faces, an old dirt road, a boy, a wheel, a stick, kingfish on the stump. We're gonna put my big new highway right through this old parish, he says. Hire your boys to build it. Only ramp for 60 miles, go right through this town. You folks gonna be eating the fat of the land. Ain't that right, Marky? 
he says to me, amen, I say. The scene goes dark, another lights, the Kingfisher's election headquarters, a victory celebration. I want a parish by parish count, the Kingfish yells. When it comes to Jasmine, DeVroe shouts, 80%. So I asked the boss, so we gonna give them their, their road? Hell no, he says, going through by you. Plans drawn, press release tomorrow. What are we gonna tell them down in Jasmine? The Kingfish looks me right in the eye. Tell him I lied, he says. DeVroe won't do it, so I make the trip myself. Press release comes out. Chairman calls a meeting of the parish council. I show up. What happened? Chairman asks. He about guarantee us that road. I step right up. Boss told me to tell you he lied, I say. Folks busting out crying and cursing. About half of them run on out the hall. Chairman and others, DeVros people, they stay, they stay quiet. And pretty soon, Chairman starts to chuckle. That's the kingfish for you, he says. Thu and thu. Our turn will come. He gone see to it. <laughs> that was wonderful. I, you know... I'm glad you talked a little bit about the inspiration for this. And I think you mentioned wondering what it was. Was it poetry or, and it really does almost read like a screenplay. I mean, the description in detail, the dialogue are just wonderful. Um, and I was already casting, uh, if we go way back uh, to Rod, I was already casting Rod Steiger or more contemporarily, I was thinking of John Goodman in the role of the Kingfish. So we've already got a cast started for you. <laughs> um, okay. But certainly the, um, I mean, it's so relevant as are most of our works here, but with politics, the corruption, the lack of truth telling, which seems to just be spreading like a virus, essentially. Uh, truth, an endangered species, I would say. So it is mm -hmm. just spot on. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for that. I'm sorry, I didn't think to ask before if people would like to see the poems on the screen or not. So maybe as each of you, before you start reading, let me know if you'd like me to pop it up on the screen, please. Good idea. Okay. And, and, and before we move to the next one, I just wanted to comment that I also enjoyed your poem very much, Ralph. And uh, I thought it was very interesting that it's only one block stanza. It's almost like it, it doesn't want to let you go. And then it grasps you with that dialogue and that specificity it was it was very well done so thank you for, for thank sharing you. It with us you're welcome thank you i've kind and of lost our... my screen i've kind of lost my screen here for a minute so let me see if i can bring it back we can up. still see you though so okay well yeah, you're still with I'll... us okay um go ahead i'll just i'll figure this out our uh, next reader is uh, Irene Cooper, and she's going to read to us a piece of fiction, uh, Bear Wolf. Irene Cooper is the author of Committal, Poet Friend is Pi Fi About Family from the VI Press and Spare Change, FLP, finalist for the Stafford Hall Award. Irene's writings appear in Denver Quarterly, The Feminist Wire, The Rumpus, Street Cake, Witness, Bulloy, and elsewhere. Irene supports AIC directed writing at Original Prison and lives with her people and Maggie in Oregon. Welcome, Irene, and please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thanks so much. I'm so pleased to be here and to um, have been able to put Writers Resist on my, uh, on my radar a while back. It's great to hear the work, too. I'm going to read. Um, a piece called Beowulf. While my glamorous friend Anne underwent her abortion, I sat at a lunch counter and ate a grilled cheese sandwich and a chocolate shake before returning to the abortion clinic in the urban grid of Brooklyn. I sat in the waiting area and read Beowulf, assigned by my high school sophomore English teacher. It wasn't hard to imagine eighth century Northern Europe 
in my Irish working class community, there was nothing unfamiliar to me about drinking halls, trash talking men, and tribal vindication. I took the side of the monsters, swollen outcasts, a vengeful mother and her son, a descendant of the fratricidal Cain, though I knew, because I knew, they were doomed, predestined martyrs to the heroic trope. It's even more difficult now that I am in late middle age and my children are tender adults, not to wish for a better outcome for Grendel's mother, incited to violence through her grief over the slaying of her son, but she never had a chance. Anne, like me, was a little younger than her peers. She was not an outsider, but neither was she popular per se. In that way too, we were alike, but that's where the similarities ended. I was overweight by the standard of the day and poorly dressed, and therefore did everything I could to deflect attention. Anne's mother worked in some mysterious capacity for Estee Lauder and brought home gallon bags of makeup samples of which Anne made liberal and dramatic use. She was dark and bird-like, an Audrey Hepburn for the 80s. In our freshman year, Anne developed appendicitis and parlayed the event into, entire, into an entire final quarter off from school, during which she sunbathed in a bikini, studied glamour and vogue, and when I came over, mined Jeremy's, her mother's boyfriend's, secret stash of penthouse magazines for story ideas. I would then type loudly on Jeremy's IBM Selectric. <laughs> Because I had no compunction about skipping school to keep Anne company, made no judgments about her hiatus, let alone her clandestine sexual relationship with a peach-faced boy two blocks over and one grade behind us, and was sometimes funny. I was the perfect and only candidate to accompany Anne to the clinic. My lack of judgment was not a virtue. It simply didn't occur to me to have, let alone take, a moral position. I was used to things, bad things just happening. I was accustomed to trying to make the best of it afterward. I finished Beowulf. Anne emerged, visibly relieved and hungry. We'd stay friends throughout the next year when she left the peninsula to live in a Soho loft with her mother and Jeremy. Sometimes when I took the train in, Rachel, Anne never called her mother mom, would take us to an art show, an occasion that left me bright-eyed and Anne bored. Mostly, we'd go to Rocky Horror screenings and drink beer, after which I'd lay on the bare loft floor, let my head swim, while Anne vomited our revelries into the toilet. Senior year, I went to Rio de Janeiro as an exchange student. The year after that, she attended a small East Coast college, and I got a retail job in Houston, where my parents had moved in my absence. We sat in my bedroom smoking parliaments with a fingernail of cocaine and the hollow tip. College was a bore, she said but there were some cute guys. We neither of us had any plans. We lived by feel, each wondering if the other didn't have the better setup. I felt at 18 that I'd forfeited my chance at college, that I was already too old. Anne enjoyed her visit best, I think, when she was flipping through bridal magazines with my mother at the kitchen table. Switched at birth, we'd joke. We didn't know it, but everything was still open to us, all our fledgling mistakes and triumphs. My eldest daughter and her fiance live in a state where abortion will remain legal for now. But the unnerving buzz is that this is the first domino, that LGBTQIA rights have been set up for a fall all along, as well as same-sex marriage and accessible contraception. What will that mean, I worry, for the younger daughter whose contraceptive implant will expire in another year? In the middle of Ron Paget's longish poem, How to Be Perfect, between cultivate good posture until it becomes natural and plan your day so you never have to rush, is the line, if someone murders your child, get a shotgun and blow his head off. Perhaps Grendel's mother was perfectly well behaved before she wasn't. I suspect good behavior or the slavish adherence to it is another big lie, another promise unfulfilled. A scene near the end of the 2005 BBC movie, The Girl in the Cafe, shows Kelly MacDonald's character in the airport with Bill Nighy's character after she's disgraced him at an international conference by talking about dying children in front of all his colleagues at the banquet table. He'd met her in a cafe and in an uncharacteristic moment of spontaneity asked her to join him for the G8 summit in Reykjavik. He knows nothing about her, duh, and is surprised and aggrieved to learn she'd been in prison. 
I heard a man. I heard a man who hurt a child, she tells him. He asks, was it your child? She answers, does it matter? In the 2007 movie version of Beowulf, Grendel's mother takes the form of a beautiful woman to seduce the hero in hopes that he will put a baby in her to replace the slaughtered Grendel. In the eighth century text, as I remember it, she remains a monster, a hag, unseductive, the corpse of her monster son buried in her hair. In either case, she has only mother for a name, not even a kenning such as demon bearer or seed furrow or icicle sheath. Nope, mother is her sole identity and purpose as far as our heroes are concerned. And then they take that from her too and rejoice. And what a man. The dear path of our friendship forked at the end of adolescence. I cultivated my own glamorous mythologies and still emerged dripping from the brine of my 20s to shed my scales on the toll road of mortgage, partner, and 2.5 kids. I never liked weddings, uneasy union of the sentimental and the transactional. But long after my own, I've become have come to appreciate the precipitous question at the core of the ritual. Will you? Is a moment of consummate agency be dazzled out of focus by diamonds and pearl encrusted lace. The whole of the endeavor, however, hangs on the answer. And commitment is a matter of individual will. And I presumed would one day say, I will, to a baby if she could, after making the choice to say, I won't. I don't presume to know what she'd think of the Supreme Court's reversal or how she might remember her own experience. I do know that when we had almost no sense of our own agency, we could take for granted that autonomy which was provided by law. We could and lawfully take care of ourselves as if we and the embattled women we were to become mattered. Thank you very much, Irene. And uh, this was a wonderful piece. And I was mainly drawn to how you refuse to to present something complex as simple. You're giving all these points. You're talking about Grendel's mother, and then you're talking about your friend, and they are both in in very defensible positions. And I feel like I get the sense from that piece of life being complicated. And in the case of of the friend, uh, she made a difficult choice at a moment where you're growing up and life is difficult anyway and now it's becoming even more difficult with the state with the loss against you so i i really appreciated that and also there was something that attracted me a lot to the narrator there is almost like a story that isn't told and little comments here and there like when she says uh, that she was used to think bad things happening and always trying to make the best of it. So it's almost like inklings of this complex narrating voice. And overall, I thought it was an, an amazing piece. And thank you very much for submitting it and thank you very much for reading it. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. All right. Is Joanne Durham still with us? I know you were talking about a, a storm, right? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Joanne Durham's poem is called Don't Give Kids Any Gifts Tied to Reading, and I'd like to present her bio. Joanne Durham is the author of To Drink from a Wider Bowl, winner of the Sinclair Poetry Prize Evening Street Press 2022, and the forthcoming on Shifting Shoals, which was published by Kelsey Books. Her poetry appears in Poetry East, Calyx, Chautauqua, Word Peace, Rise Up Review, and many other journals and anthologies. She lives on the North Carolina coast with the ocean as her backyard and muse. I love that. Okay, let's hear your poem. Okay, well, thanks so much. And um, it, it is really nice to, uh, to be here and just in this environment and listen to each other's work and talk about it. I, I really appreciate that. And I really pre appreciate Writers Resist for, um, encouraging people to write poetry that steps out into the big world. Uh, my poem um, 
came about um, when I saw on Twitter um, the, several, maybe last year sometime, how the one of the school systems in Florida had sent this memo to all the teachers um, telling them the new regulations based on all the book censorship and book banning and everything that was going on. And one of the uh, dictums was, don't give kids any gifts tied to reading. And um, having been an elementary school teacher and having had poetry totally all the time in my classroom, uh, I that just was like, you know, a stab in my heart. And I just felt compelled um, to, to write this poem. Um, <clears throat> so don't give kids any gifts tied to reading. Oh, and I wanted to say one other thing. Um, all the references to the different um, titles of these poetry books are all, uh, if you're not familiar with kids' poetry, they're all wonderful poetry books by um, wonderful authors like Eloise Greenfield and Kwame Alexander and uh, Grace Nichols and representing all sorts of multicultural and, and, and diverse um, aspects of life that personally I think should be in every elementary school classroom. <laughs> Go then, pack away, honey I love, unfit title for eight-year-olds. Hide, can I touch your hair? Braided with so much empathy, it must be banned. Destroy a Caribbean dozen, the book Robert finds first thing each morning, which sometimes gets him through the day without stabbing a classmate with his pencil. I practice the poems from Haiti, he tells me. Remove good books, good times, the editor was gay. Search Daryl before he goes home. I'm sure there's no pocket full of poems to read with a flashlight under his covers. Snatch out of wonder out of Eddie's hands as he and Dora share the rocking chair, puzzling over chasing justice and smile like moon. She teaches him the hard words. He shows her the funny part about alphabet soup. Choosing their favorite books, they give each other gifts they must unlearn to give. Sanitize the empty poetry shelf, just in case some trace of joy remains. Thank you. That's just so wonderful, Joanne. Um, I have to say, I'm just stunned and not in a good way about the, it seems every day in the news, we read of yet another incidence of book banning or attempts at such, and it's heartbreaking. Um, and I love the way in the poem, I mean, the whole thing is powerful. And I love the way the voice, your voice in the poem, the way you give us the kids and it gets more and more personal as we picture them and the impact that literature and poetry has upon their lives. And then you give us that just gut punch of an ending, which is sanitize the empty poetry shelf just in case of some, some trace of joy remains. I mean, that's just awesome. Great way to, to end that poem. But, um, you know, I would think leave a lot of people in tears when you think about that. But thank you so much for that work. Thank you. Uh, I am going to present now our next reader. It's uh, Rebecca K. Lee. She's going to read to us a poem. Feeding stray cats in Ukraine. Uh, Rebecca has spent a lifetime across the Potomac uh, River from Washington, D.C., seeing the best of times and the worst. Writing poetry keeps her sane, and I think that might be true for a lot of us as well. So, welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for reading with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, that's across the Potomac River from from Washington. And uh, I started uh, my career in Washington as a newspaper reporter. And one of the things that uh, always struck me was how often people would respond in a, in a horrible, huge event. People could take it in so much more easily through a small incident or a small detail um, rather than the overwhelming numbers or the overwhelming uh, awfulness of it. Uh, and so my poetry often um, goes to that, to the small detail or the little item or whatever. And this, this poem um, 
came from, I, I think it was a story, a reference uh, in the Washington Post. It may have been in the New York Times. I don't remember which, but it was, it was just one of those little details I read in the story and it prompted, it prompted this one. Feeding stray cats in Ukraine. As molecules of steel madness concussed the air and no next breath was sure, a vibration in his unbowed soul prompted Sasha to step outside and feed a posse of stray cats. The offering from one displaced in the world to others also beggared cost Sasha his right foot. War presents at times a tableau for tenderness, often anonymous, usually unseen. It always presents a canvas for cruelty, unfathomable, yet undaunting, to the merciful who step outside to succor the world. Thank you very much. We we were very moved by this poem, and um, and there's a lot good about it. Uh, I wanted to point out the, that image in the beginning, the molecules of steel madness. That uh, that's an amazing image, and a beautiful way of using language and poetic language to make things new, and at the service of of this message that is so important. And one thing that struck me, and I don't know if this was pur purposeful also or not, is that the, the poem is organized in, in three line stanzas. And at one point that order breaks, but then in the end it comes back, almost like a, as a, a resolution has been a shift in a way. Uh, was this on purpose? Whoops. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I thought I hit something. Um, no, not really. It just, it just came out that way. Well, it came nothing, out amazingly. Nothing profound about it. Nothing profound. It came out amazingly that way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I just want to add one quick comment. Your um, talk about in the poem about uh, that war, uh, the juxtaposition of war with the. Uh, tableau of tenderness reminds me of a colleague who was a psychiatrist and uh, worked at um, the Naval Hospital with and had worked when he was overseas with Marines in Fallujah, Camp Fallujah. And he talked about how important these geese were to those Marines that would check on them every day. They were occupied a big pond in the middle of the camp and that they would, you know, check on the geese every day. And indeed, there is that capability for tenderness, but uh, why do we have to have war to generate that? So, okay, so our next reader is Dallas Saylor. And the poem, and Dallas is here, correct? Yeah. I'm here, yep. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, Dallas's poem is Arby's Pilot Casino, and his bio. Um, T. Dallas Thaler, uh, who uses pronouns he and they, is a PhD candidate in poetry at Florida State University, and he holds an MFA from the University of Houston. His work meditates on the body, especially gender and sexuality, against physical, spiritual, and digital landscapes. His poetry has been featured in Prairie Schooner, Poetry Northwest, Colorado Review, Christianity and Literature, Prism International, and elsewhere. He currently lives in Houston, Texas. All right. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I, that bio is a little bit old. I'm actually in Denver right now, but I moved just last year. So it, oh, I was in okay. Houston. I'm in Denver now, um, but still deeply love Houston. And actually, this poem uh, kind of takes place in between Houston and Florida. Um, going back to uh, Louisiana again, um, I was thinking about this when, when Wells was reading. Uh, I'm, I'm also taking place in Louisiana here, and I've also got a highway in mind. So here's the poem, Arby's Pilot Casino. Blessed are the poor in spirit, says Gordon McKernan, big truck lawyer, on one of his dozens of billboards lining the Louisiana stretch of I-10, mixed in with ads for Boudin and Cracklins, the Kushana Casino, the Tiger Truck Stop, which, after 
our tiger lived longer, then I'm not sure, then whom I'm not sure, now features a live camel. And Gordon's rival, Morris Bart, one call, y'all. I pull off for gas at one of these holy trinity complexes featuring fuel plus fast food plus casino. The Doors cartoon miner pans for gold, swears that in the time I idle guzzling a dozen gallons into my tank or choosing between combo three and combo five, I could be striking it so rich I'll blow bills out my tailpipe as I rock it right out of this state. And why stop there, out of the country, off the surface of the planet? In the bathroom, as I wash up at the sink, adjust my skinny ass jeans over my small frame, straighten my N95 and fluff my long curls in the mirror. A man walks in and stops, apologizes, pokes his head out the door and double checks the sign. Why do I feel like I've won this one? Gotten away with something forbidden, delicious, like the extra large fry, like one last quarter slipped in the slit of the slot machine. And at last, the crank comes up three sevens. I'm biblically blessed, birthmarked, not a man in the desert, but the desert in a man, a camel stuck in a truck stop, or three cherries, meaning the rib is ready to rip, burst forth from my chest, compete with a Coke and knowledge of good and evil. So bless my poor queer spirit, God, because I'm blowing this joint. I'm using my one call, y'all, blasting off this nationwide runway straight to the stars on a full stomach, full tank. Thanks. We cannot hear you, Debbie. Here I was making profound comments and you couldn't hear me. No, just kidding. Um, I, was, I really, really love the energy in this poem. I mean, there's a lot I love about it. It is, again, um, I think, you know, with the detail and description, it is it is cinematic, too. I feel like I'm right there. I'm looking at this truck stop. And I love the speaker's sense of victory as it gains energy to the end and that he's blowing the joint and he's blasting off at the end. I mean, that's just wonderful the way that ends. Um, so, again, I just love that. It was wonderful. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you, thank you. And I second all the comments uh, from Irene Cooper. Great sounds, Elizabeth Chuck. It was delightfully vibrant, and the humor from KB. It is just so celebratory and so full of life. So thank you very much. And uh, now I'm going to introduce Elizabeth Chuck. She's going to be reading September together. Elizabeth Jack lives in central Illinois with her spouse, cat, and an expanding collection of art supplies and fitness equipment. Her poetry and fiction have appeared in the MacGuffin, Writer's Resist, Daily Science Fiction, and other magazines and anthologies. She attended the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop for Poetry in 2022. For more of her work, you can visit her website. Thanks, um, and thanks for organizing this, this chance for all of us to gather together and celebrate a bit of resistance. Um, this, this poem I'm going to read was written for a class on the prompt of hope, which was tricky because I've been having trouble finding hope these days. So this is September Together. Last September, we hiked the forest beside the fog-drenched sea, followed a swift stream bridged with salmon spawning, returning from gray Pacific homes, switchbacked beside a waterfall sparkling down steep granite, emerged into sunlight with a view of lichen painted rock and the blue white ice that once sculpted this verdant valley, is still sculpting, just as moss and fern carpeted bare rock, as alder and spruce sprouted, as forest appeared where glacier receded, today melting ice reshapes coasts Forests flame to ash, grasslands wither to desert, rivers run to dust. This September, whales still sing in the sea. Will you fight with me for this vibrant, dying world?
another amazing piece and uh and that ending i mean if i have to answer yes of course in uh, in the poem itself uh there is there is a moment that that made it shift for me when you said that um that the water is still sculpt sculpting the, the landscape like up until that point the landscape seemed like something fixed and then you realize that it's continually transforming and you're part of it so that line for me was very illuminating and thank you very much for that okay are we ready for the next reader okay i'm unmuted right Oh, there's there's something. No, you're not. But I wanted to say something that KB posted on uh, on the chat, and I think it's amazing. She said that she used your poem, uh, Elizabeth, in her gender studies classes, in which they also also teach the climate crisis. So, excellent. Thank you. I don't know why I'm typing in chat instead of just saying that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, the more writing we can get about the climate crisis, the more I hope we enlighten folks. So thank you for writing something I can include. Okay, our next reader is Claudia Ware and her narrative nonfiction piece is When You Swim Out Into the Ocean. Claudia Ware is a writer and editor from Virginia. Her work has appeared in JMWW, The Wondrous Real Magazine, Type House Literary Magazine, Corvid Queen, and elsewhere. You can read more about her at her website or find her on Twitter, which I know KB will post that, those links. Thank you so much for having us for this. Um, it's wonderful to gather with all the writers. out into the ocean. You float on your back, your face barely above water. There's nothing but the silence of the ocean in your ears. In the salt water's embrace, you drift, weightless. You stare at the clouds above, trying to empty your mind. You're away from the beach, not so far that the lifeguard blows her whistle, just far enough away from the splashers and the screamers. The ocean is peace. Here, you're a gently bobbing body, not a stupid nigger like the man on the boardwalk said when he bumped into you. The water doesn't care that your skin is dark brown or that your hair curls tight. You're a small human in a vast ocean. The rage subsides to a dull ache. Your muscles finally relax. You roll over and swim back to shore. Stroke, stroke, breathe. Stroke, stroke, breathe. Then you feel gravity again. Feel the sand, feel the breeze. You find your white friends and sit on your towel. No one asks how you are. And you pretend you are fine. Mm. Thank you, Claudia. It is such a powerful piece. And I mean, there are so many things that strike me. And one of them is that what you accomplish in so few words in this uh, brief piece, um, the juxtapositions, you set the scene, you lull us until we're in the ocean floating with you. And then it's like, bam, the harsh reality. We feel our own breath as the speaker swims to shore. And the last line, I mean, you took us from the phrase, the ocean is peace to, and you pretend you are fine. Beautiful. This is so poignant. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now uh, we have uh, a reader from our latest issue, the one before this one. She, she couldn't join us for that reading, but she's here with us uh, tonight. Renee McClellan, she's going to be reading for us two poems, Dystopia and Datri. And uh, Renee McClellan is a Chicago native writer, 
uh, of Emmy award-winning PSA Pikmin, Toy Long. She began her career performing with elite theater groups in Chicago. As a film and television actor, she performed in such productions as Brewster's Place, Seinfeld, and Deep Impact. She continued on, on writing, directing, and producing various films and television projects. A graduate of Chapman University with a BFA in film production, she also has an MFA in screenwriting from the American Film Institute. A Long Beach resident, Renee has produced many award-winning productions, often using Long Beach as the backdrop for her artistic expression. She is currently a professor at Pepperdine University, a best-selling author and an award-winning filmmaker. We are very happy to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. I'm taking you everywhere I go, Renee, so you can introduce me. <laughs> I love that introduction. <laughs> All right, the piece that I'm going to do um, is called Black Listopia. And uh, Listopia is a list of good reads. And I know with all these amazing writers and, and readers here, we, we, are, we often have a Listopia. But this is called Black Listopia. I feel like an idiom that drips from Baldwin's pen. Not that angry Black woman negotiating sin. I am not your Negro. A thing to be had, thick lips, curvaceous hips, or a fashion fad. You can't set me like diamonds or string me like pearls, pick on my Afro, then appropriate my curls. I am a Black woman, Black, brown, and yellow too. Why are you fucking with me? I don't fuck with you. I feel like a literary assault by Langston Hughes, not that angry Black woman in her weary blues. I too sing America, a pejorative dream. Ghosts of my ancestors flow in my bloodstream. That white picket fence and that sweet apple pie. That dream wasn't mine. That nightmare's a lie. Like a raisin in the sun, do I fester? Do I run? What happens to a dream deferred? <laughs> you looking at it. You haven't heard. I am a Black woman. Black, brown, and yellow too. Stop fucking with me and I won't fuck with you. I feel like a mythical logophile, words linger in pride. Like Zora Neale Hurston, my eyes are watching God. Truth be told, every tongue must confess. Like dust on the road, I'm God's perfect mess. Perfectly flawed and divinely conceived, all of Africa holds the mystery that is me. Ripped from my familiar, felt the soul of my seed. My daughters are raped and my sons can't breathe. I'm a paradigm of potency, a leather-bound force, an African-fused American on a reparation course. I am a Black woman, Black, brown, and yellow too. I will not apologize for this trauma. Fuck you. Angelou knew in her encouragement, wise, like a phoenix from its ashes, still I rise. A phenomenal woman, phenomenally. I'm a queen like Sheba with the bones of blue sea. And with all that was taken on the infamous boat ride, my wound for stock and trade for my baby's genocide, I should be angry, it's justifiably so. You auction the fruit of my womb, then you call me a hoe. You rip from Mother Africa the proverbs of her son and refuse to honor her for the work that she has done. Her children will rise like the sun bathed in blue. Ebony warriors and the daughters of Shaka Zulu. I am a black woman and I'm angry as fuck. But forgiveness in this moment, bitch, good luck. I'm not the peace you seek. I won't lay down and die. I won't turn the other cheek. I want an eye for a motherfucking eye. I am a black woman. This is the America I sing. But you keep fucking with me. You know what? Hold my motherfucking earrings. I hope everybody was ready for the, that profanity. <laughs> I did a disclaimer at first. I should have done another one. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's such an amazing poem. It was such an amazing reading. It, it came alive. So thank you for bringing it alive for us today. I know Renee encouraged me to go ahead and use those words. So <laughs> it's all your fault, Renee. <laughs> I'll take um, it. <laughs> right. So the other one that I did was um, I'm not I, I can't remember if I made any changes to it. Um, do you mind putting it up on the on the screen, KB?
This one is called That Tree. And I, I think I might have changed something. So I kind of want to stick with what I wrote on this one. Strange fruit hanging from that tree. The crown shudders with each crosswind. Leaves of humanity blow like flecks of dust on the sea. Seeds sprinkled on top of soil. The roots spiral deep and strong. The branches sway, reaching for the sun, limbs refusing to break. Spiny twigs like fingers closed around a tight fist. The trunk solid, taking shape, searching for a place to exist. Branches reaching toward the warmth of the sun, but meeting the coldness of too much shade, flailing in mercy. No sustenance to nurture its existence. Life dangles from that tree, dangling, shapeless, caught in the ambiguity of the whistling wind. The fruit falls from the tree, pulled to the ground by desire, with thick tentacles of hope. Strange fruit growing on that tree. Thank you. <laughs> Marine, thank you. After the other poem, this this poem feels like a like a punch. <laughs> well, I just gave you one too. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, and Debbie, I think we have reached the end of our readers for tonight. Yes, I believe we have. We were uh, KB. You talked about having somebody read the uh, one piece. Um, we're, we're almost to our timeline as we normally um, yeah. schedule it, but if people want to read whatever second piece they brought, um, Renee and Debbie, do you have a little more time? Sure, I do. And yeah. I remember Claudia, Claudia mentioned a second piece, right? Another piece, yeah, yeah. If we have time, we can read that one I mentioned, you all, but... Uh, um, have people that are here read. Yeah, let's go with people who are present first. Okay. Renee, do you think we want to go back and ask people in the order in which they read or? Oops, find my... Yeah, that, that is a great idea. So we have uh, Nikki. Sheet sheet here. Sorry, I had a cough drop. Um, I do, I do have a second one um, to read. Um, this was, uh, it's it's small though. It's two hundred fifty words. So this was um, originally published in Bright Flash Literary, and uh, it's called Broken. And um, <clears throat> all right, Dr. Lowry says the community community garden is mandatory not because they need the food, they charge enough to afford any organic imaginable, but because it instills a sense of shared purpose. I'm assigned watering duties for the same reason an anorexic is forced to finish their meal or a bulimic can't go to the bathroom alone after eating. Trowels, spades, and other such sharp objects present too much of a temptation. I'm not to be trusted. Even though the day nears triple digits, as usual, I wear a long sleeve shirt. Through the thin cotton fabric, I feel the thick striations of scar tissue that carve a road map to nowhere over my arms. The first cut was when I was 14, after we won the California State Championship, when coach did that thing, and then again every time after. Another cut when I told my father I wanted to quit and he said, but we didn't come this far. And then again, after, when the other girls had come forward and my mother's eyes narrowed and she asked, what did you do now? I explained to Dr. Lowry, the pain is hot and viscous, like lava that flows underneath my skin. And when I cut, it dissipates. If I don't, it hardens until movement becomes effort and my bones threaten to break with the weight of it. Near the tomatoes, I see a glint of green flash brightly in the black dirt. I reach down, pick up the small piece of glass, cradle it in my palm like a rare jewel. 
It gleams the color of the ocean in a travel brochure, the color of rolling hills in a faraway country, the color of hope. I slip the jagged gem in my pocket, not to cut myself with, but to remind myself that a broken thing can still be beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Wells Burgess, do you have another piece you'd like to read? Is Wells still with us? Muted though. Ah, you have to unmute. We can hear you, Will. Uh, okay, you can see see me and hear me now? Yes. Okay, all right. This is a poem I wrote two or three, three or four years ago, I think. Well, four years ago, I'm 85 now. It's called Coming Out Late. At 81, run out of words, jaw twitching from psychotropic meds. Where have I been? What have I been about? All those candles I snuffed out that might have lit the path. Remember Ray? If you don't embrace it, he said, that day we went skating, your life is imitation. I believe it now, but I postponed it then. Am I now too late to meet the me I fled? Fearing the pleasure still, I forge ahead. What else? I can't go back. You have the time, they tell me. Bullshit, I can't do this, I say. That's altogether true. But then I write this poem, I can, I do. Very nice, thank you. And now, uh, Irene, do you have something else for us? I do. I'm, I'm going to see, since you're generous enough to let us screen share, I think I will, because it has a little bit of a shape to it. It's a poem. K sada sada is not fatalism, is not to be or not to be mean at the core of matter, like a corm in relation to a crocus pit to peach tree, a seed in relation to the right conditional. Lots of germinations fail to thrive, resist the visible. What will be will be aspirational, microbial, a missing gene, a quarantine of least resistance incubate, intubate, blooming misogyny, innocence, be not synonymous with dumb virtues, vice in drag, the numbers grow too large to fathom, a sum known only by its kin, one million killed is 10, is one killed, plus so many nothings at their wake, what was, ain't, and what will be is panacea for the pain struck, the scorch of powder, and the scare cities of what will be a matter of trigger and of choice, detour and deter, a matter of state, and all but out of your hands, baby. Amen. That was amazing, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Joanne Durham, do you have another piece for us? Uh, yes, I do. I just couldn't get to the right spot there. Um, this poem um, is called Superpowers, and uh, it, it's in my poetry book, To Drink From a Wider Bowl. Um, it first came out in um, Ocotillo Review, and just this last week was in um, Poetry X Hunger, which, if you all don't know, it is an um, online journal that's devoted to poetry that um, is in service of, of, of speaking out against hunger in our world. So some of you might have poems that you might want to submit there. Superpowers, <clears throat> after a photograph from the New York Times. Formed from a torn tablecloth, his checkered cape floats freely behind him, arms spread, one foot suspended in air, ready to leap from the kitchen shelf into his father's arms. 
He has his balance, a five-year-old boy with superpowers, a boy ready for flight. The boy will take flight soon with his father, but they will not fly, they will walk, perhaps more than a hundred shadeless days. They will leave behind the tablecloth, the kitchen, the brilliant hues of the Quetzal, Quetzal bird flying across a woven blanket. The father has surveyed his coffee fields, once fertile, leaves now consumed in brown fungus, no sooner rotting than passing their poison to the next plant, leaving the belly of the boy almost as empty as the belly of the father. I wish him superpowers to move safely across borders he knows they are not welcome to cross spurned by a power as unyielding as his land. Hmm. Thank you so much for that piece. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, Rebecca, do you have anything for us? I have one, um, another short one, as journalistically all of mine are short. Um, and this is whoever said that he wanted more environmental ones. This is one from, uh, well, the New York, the epigram on it says the wildfire wiped out 95% of paradise, which is from Time Magazine in November 2018. Yeah. We've gotten used to the wildfires in California then, but this was when, this was before we had gotten used to them so much. One wonders. The tire has vaporized, half of its rim melted, liquefying, like a marshmallow fallen on hot coals. An orange X on the driver's door, the solitary color in an ashy tableau, signals the sedan was searched, but withholds any clue whether cinders inside mix those of leather seats with those of a man caught in his last traffic jam. But perhaps he got out and ran, his sneakers melting to the asphalt as he lost a hundred yard dash to a fire moving a half mile a minute. One wonders if in his last moment, he surrendered belief that the climate wouldn't change in paradise. Hmm. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank uh, you. Dallas? Yeah, Dallas Saylor. You have another one for us? Yeah, I do have another one. Um, and I can also screen share. So um, my sister is here today. She's hanging out in the Zoom room uh, hearing me read. And I wanted to read this one especially for her because uh, she shows us briefly as a little cameo, but also um, We've been uh, doing Rubik's Cubes together recently. It's just a, a thing that we've been doing, and this poem kind of features some Rubik's Cubes. And uh, I got some friends over also who are oh. listening to me read, so thank you for that. And uh, this one's a little bit mathy, um, and I've got a, a math friend over today, so thought I'd read uh, this one for you guys. And let me go ahead and screen share real quick also. Okay. It's called Ortega. A classic boy sees girl scene at the diner. Me with a plastic cup of chocolate milk across from my mom and sister, tucked on the inside of a booth beside my partner, Emily, and her with a two by two Rubik's cube, which she passes back and forth to a teen boy, her brother, I assume, unsolved. If she knew how to solve a three by three, the corner algorithms could bring her home. And if not, the Ortega method isn't too bad a freer orientation that saves all permutation for one final 5K step. And I could place my hands on her thin fingers and how all the colors would line up in her eyes, cheeks, lips. How easy, after all, to carry polyamory each day like grade school textbooks in a cheap backpack, always hard back against my nerdy lumbar, a bag picked up as I roll off the bedside and laid down again with love as I switch on the nightstand lamp, though sometimes needed again late. How last night I cried on the bathroom floor at 3 a.m. over letters exchanged this week, an old friend I let get away before I knew options were an option, 
losing them to an ex who took me like a drug. How Emily held the toilet seat up as I held my stomach and wondered whether the next letter would bring disappointment or trouble. But she saw how the past sat in my lap like a big smooth stone and at last said, you should go for it. And soon my stomach forgave me back to bed, the bag quiet, heavy, awaiting dawn, a diner, a pint so sweet I down it in one gulp. Good thing I'm trapped against a wall beside the Tabasco and Splenda, unable to scramble my tongue stupid. Stupid to feel this way. Three and a half million possible scrambles just on a two by two. Three and a half million ways to mess this up. Let's turn to the bag, see what today's weight brings me to cope. Algebraic structures, third edition. The collected poems of Jack Gilbert. The ethical slut. <laughs> Love the ethical slut. You had me there. <laughs> Thanks, Dallas. Elizabeth Shack, do you have another piece for us? I do. I have a uh, short one. It's a high boon. Uh, it's coming out soon in the spring issue of Cattail's Journal. Uh, this is called First Chilly Day. Beauty in the goldfinch that flutter to walnut perches under a flat sky. Beauty in the yellow leaves that cascade in a memory of butterflies. Beauty in bright goldenrod dancing to cricket drone. Beauty in the rabbit that flashes across the path to become a trail of waving grasses. Fat bee on thistlehead, for how long? I'm apparently in an autumn reading mood today. Thank you. And now, uh, Claudia? Claudia Ware? Yes. Let's see if I can find it, okay. This is a very short one, um, If I Had Wings, and it's coming out this spring in The Scent of Fictionist. If I Had Wings. I hovered at the edge of the playground, wishing I could join the little white girls in the sandbox. My mother glanced at their parents on the other park bench and shook her head. No, she said, you never know with those people. A weight like a stone settled in my stomach. I understood. I was only seven, but I knew the word nigger. It meant ugly, less than. I sat in the swing, pumped my legs and went up, up, flying above those little white girls. I imagined the day I'd fly so high, I wouldn't notice them at all. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. For sharing that. And as uh, Renee, do you have another one for us? Of course I do. <laughs> I got a whole book. <laughs> um, I wanted to do uh, one that um, was like a tribute to moms. Uh, my daughter is on here and my daughter in law. And um, so I'm dedicating this poem to them and to all mommies. Um, it's called So She Said, and how when we ask mommy for something, you know, and, and we really want it, and she says, you know, so like, she said I can't do it, you know. So that's the, the that was the uh, motivation for this poem. It's called So She Said. When I was two, oh, what to do in the rem state of rambunctious, inquisitive two. So she said, don't touch that, I'll tell your dad, oh, he'll be angry, he'll be mad. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, move from the TV, I can't see. Leave that alone, we're going home. Don't eat the broom, the water in the toilet is not to consume. <sighs> when I was adolescent, so long and lean, pimples and puberty, life was so mean. So she said, 
God is good. The devil is bad. Stand up straight. Lift up your head. It's okay. It'll be all right. Dry your tears. Learn to fight. Don't kiss the boys that break your heart. Always finish what you start. Cross at the corners. Travel in packs. Don't talk to strangers. Learn the facts. Hurry up. You'll be late. Who's that guy? You got a date. Are you a virgin? Don't answer that. Retaining water? It's just getting fat. Be in by 12. That skirt's too small. Exam tomorrow. Going to the mall. Hmm. When I was 20 and the number two. I thought I was fine. I knew what to do. So I said, listen, she, you've done your part. You've birthed a spirit and shaped a heart. I'm climbing mountains, kissing the sun, changing the game for the ones to come, breathing in freedom from a bloodstained sage. I'm your continuation as you turn the page. Like liquid wisdom, your words I drank in, lessons of life and negotiating sin. You set the bar for the thirst in my head. Now let me live. I can't play dead. So she said, all right, all right, this is true. I am she and you are you. Now climb your mountains and learn to win, learn to lose and back again. But always remember, if you should fall, that I am here to answer your call, to listen to troubles, to smile on face, to dance in pleasure and pray for grace. Hmm. Now I'm 40 and the number two with my own little sugar. She's spicy too. But my she is gone. My spirits are low. My heart yearns for that voice I know. My memories fade of a tumultuous hue. But where's my she entombed in truth? I held her hand and I closed her eyes. I listened. I smiled. I prayed. I cried. I kissed her photo. And I said goodbye. Hmm. My sugar sours a sophomoric me, my rebellious sweetheart, a facsimile. I choose my weapon standing firm, and then I remember the lessons I've learned, and then her words escape my lips, pushing past my fingertips. My she had entered into my head all the words that she had said. Climb your mountains, learn to win, learn to lose and back again. But always remember, it will always be that you are my reason oh, and I am your she. I dedicate that to my daughter, my sweet daughter, my sweet daughters, Sharonda and Blair and, and Kiwi. <laughs> and to all the mommies, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's just great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you all for sharing that second round of wonderful pieces. Um, KB, I just want to defer to you. What do you think? We're kind of at the our end of our time, I would think. Yeah, it's been an absolute delight. Um, thank you all so much. Some really fabulous writing tonight. It's been such a treat. And awesome. Yeah, Renee, thank you. you thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone as well for coming and sharing your work. This was an amazing night. <laughs> Thank you. It really was. And lastly, I just want to say to everybody, and keep making good trouble and keep up the resistance. All right. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Sharonda. Bye, Blair. Bye, Antoine. Bye, Kiwi. Bye, Trinell. <laughs> Bye, Claudia. Bye, Elizabeth. <laughs> Bye, Renee. <laughs> My Wells, <laughs> my Debbie, Hi, everybody, <laughs> my Sophia, my Elizabeth, <laughs> my KB. <laughs> this Thank is fun. You all. I'm stopping bye, recording now, but you can keep saying bye. Bye, 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 Nikki, bye, Kiwi, bye, Charlie. <laughs>